Uh, one of those who were killed, I think it was a, a man named, uh, a black man by the name of Donegan. Do I have that right? William Donegan, an elderly man, 84 years old, who was very, uh, he had been a cobbler, very prominent in the black community, uh, had considerable wealth and property, uh, was also married to a white woman. So that was a factor that also very angered unusual, the mob. unusual, I would think, in 1908. Yes. But they had been living as man and wife for years. Right. Uh, for 30 or more years, but the mob singled him out for his success and for his marriage to a white Did they woman. know of him, or did he happen to be walking down the street, or do no, we know they, how did they see They him knew of him, and we know that there were people in the mob who had even served him and his family. So there was knowledge of the people that were killed. There was another black man, a Scott Burton, who was a barber. Uh, he was also lynched. One of the exhibits that you have on display here is, a, is even a, a piece of the tree in which Donegan was yes. hung. How did that come about, and, and why would that be part of the display? Okay, well, in riots, in lynchings, the mob is thirsty, hungry for souvenirs. They will tear parts of clothing. In many cases, they actually mutilate the body of the people that they lynch, and they want the souvenir, the memory, almost as a trophy, so they hack away at the tree. The tree on which Barton was hung, the next couple of days there was no more tree because so many people had hacked at it for souvenirs. Well, the and ghastly as it souvenir, of, isn't it? Ghastly souvenir is a very curious artifact of the exhibit. But fortunately, the, um, the library, the museum library collection includes uh, these souvenirs. So you'll see two pieces of wood marked as souvenirs from the tree on which Scott Burton, the first black uh, lynching victim, was hung. As we stand here in the atrium of the library where the uh, panels depict the story we're talking about of the Springfield race rights of 1908, and we see people gathered and looking at this exhibit, what would you as the curator what is the point of putting on this kind of a display? And what would you want the people who are here uh, to take away from this exhibit, aside from the mere knowledge of the, the events that unfolded back then? Okay. To under, as you say, to know what had happened, to have a clear idea of the story, but also to understand why it happened, how it happened, and how the racial divisions of that day still plague us. And so it's really necessary that we, a hundred years later, need to recall, remember, understand what it was that triggered that race riot or made it uh, so possible. Because those problems in different shapes and different forms are still with us. Race is still with us. It's deep. It's abiding. When it would the there was a smoldering resentment between peoples that I would think Mabel's cry of rape was the spark but there had to have been I would have thought some divisions between the races the classes uh, that triggered it would that be fair? Absolutely the Mabel Hallam rape was just the the immediate trigger for the riot but it happened within a whole context of a community that was divided by race, where blacks were separate and unequal, where they were considered a threatening black presence. Blacks in the North as in the South were considered that they had to remain in their place, not be uppity, not challenge the white community in any way, word or deed or in material success. There was a great deal of resentment on the part of whites for the success that many blacks had achieved. Let me ask, to what extent, and again, going to the legacy of that and bringing it to today, to what extent when we talk about racism, is it really classism? Is it a question of not necessarily disliking someone for the color of their skin, but as you were saying, not to be uppity, that mm -hmm. people should know their place. Mm -hmm. To that end, we have classism within the white community, mm -hmm. with, I mean, uh, you look at places like England where they've had very strict classism, and it's hard for, and it always seems to be within the humanity, mm -hmm. clashes between people trying to 
move out of what others would say are your preordained spot in life. Mm -hmm. Is to what extent do we should we as individuals trying to understand these events and apply to our own lives? Mm -hmm. How do we interpret what, what is a racism purely for the color of one's skin versus mm -hmm. classism, or is it all intermixed? Well, to some extent, it's intermixed. There's no question that many of the rioters were lower class and felt more threatened by blacks at, at any level than other whites did. But the fact that in 2008, race is still the primary indicator of quality of life demonstrates that race still outshines class as a primary generator of conflict, primary explanation of status in life. Well, Dr. Mayor Clark, but thank you for showing us this. I know this is going to be part of a day-long examination of these issues, the events, the issues, and the meaning of it. And we thank you for sharing your thoughts with us on the Illinois Channel. Thank you. Thanks so much. You're watching.